You know, it's easy to make fun of the guy, and Lord knows I'm guilty of it too, but I think Vince Russo gets a lot of undue flack. Sure, he offends wrestling purists with his lack of interest in the actual you know, wrestling, but history shows that wrestling itself doesn't always draw a crowd. And yes, he's responsible for some of the tackiest storylines to affect three major U.S. wrestling companies, but no booker ever bats a thousand. This may shock some of you, but honestly, I consider myself a fan of Russo's. Even though he's shown that having unchecked power over creative can lead to some cringeworthy results, I appreciate his philosophy of characters and story over athleticism. Like Vince, I certainly care more about why two guys are fighting more than how many flips they can do. As a head writer, he always tried to give everybody something to do, not just save his energy for the top guys. Compared to the scene in today's WWE, that's kind of a revolutionary concept. If I'm being honest here, if it weren't for Russo's writing in the late 90s, I don't think I would have become a wrestling fan. So even though he's an easy target, I still owe a lot to him. Recently, I discovered something that Vinnie Rue did in the mid-2000s that gave me pause. An idea that, on the surface, seems ridiculous and sure makes The Undertaker crucifying Steve Austin look mighty awkward in hindsight. I'm talking about Ring of Glory, a passion project that Russo put together in 2005. The idea was to combine wrestling with the message of the Lord, packed with esteemed wrestling veterans, talent that were on loan from TNA, and other unsigned young prospects, the goal was to take it on the road and to perform in front of churches all over the country, but in the end, it never got off the ground. Though the answer as to why may become obvious very soon, let's go through the organization's brief history to get more of a sense of what was going on. In late 2004, Vince Russo left total nonstop action. Having recently become a born-again Christian, he said that at the time, he felt there wasn't a place for him in the wrestling business. But soon after his departure, he was approached by a man named Andrew Mincy, a former member of Power Team who, at the time, had been training to wrestle. Power Team, for those unaware, is a group of evangelical Christian beefcakes who do a bunch of wild and crazy crap with fire, bricks, and license plates in order to show their love and devotion to Jesus Christ. There are probably a few details in the middle I'm forgetting. Mincy, who's also known as Asa Andrew, pitched to Russo the concept of mixing wrestling and religion. Now, history has shown these two things often don't work well together, but in the right context, with the right message, he and Vince believed that it was possible to use professional wrestling to help spread the gospel. So just to recap, Vince Russo, the guy who left professional wrestling, decided to start a new wrestling league? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Russo and Mincy's first show took place at the Covenant Life Worship Center in Chickamauga, Georgia on February 20th, 2005. Simply called Glory, the ring was built on the stage of the Super Church, which now officially beats the inside of a Walmart as the weirdest place I've ever seen a wrestling ring. And if that wasn't crazy enough, as Scott's Hudson and Demore break down the evening's action, suddenly the lights cut out and... What? How'd that man get into the church without disintegrating? And make no mistake about it, I am the Lord of this world. In a brilliant casting choice that I would unknowingly replicate years later, Father James Mitchell played, well, Father James Mitchell, but he was basically the devil for the purpose of the show. After all, it's all about you, isn't it? Just the way I planned it. We go backstage where Goldilocks is interviewing former X Division champion Sonny Siaki, who's with his wife Desire and their children, but they're interrupted by Mitchell, who we'll be seeing a lot of in the show. You're going to give thanks to somebody for something you accomplished, something you did. Did he give you any victories? No, you did. Everything we have, everything we say, everything we owe, we give thanks to him. Throughout the entire show, they make a lot of references to him. You know, he did this, giving glory to him. Psst, hey guys, it's okay to say God's name here. You're literally in his house. Our first match is between Siaki and David Young. The first thing I noticed when watching this show was everyone was covered up. Every wrestler on this show was wearing a shirt of some kind, even if they had great physiques. To make matters worse, some guys decided to eschew tights altogether and just wear workout pants, making the whole thing look very backyard. I'm guessing this had to be some kind of concession made at the request of the church, some modesty thing. But I find it ironic that they would require the wrestlers to cover up, yet apparently had no problem with all the inherent violence in wrestling. Interfering in this oh my god! Mm, a little too on the nose. Of course, what kind of show written and produced by Vince Russo would this be if there wasn't a good old-fashioned swerve? Desire inexplicably costs her husband the match and decides to align herself with Mitchell. Now, Russo has said that when he worked on this show, he was inspired by stories from the Bible. So, in the wake of Desire's betrayal, wondering when in this show we'll see her get stoned to death. Our next contest pits Mike Sanders and Disco Inferno against Johnny Swinger and Adam Jacobs, a guy I've never heard of before. I'm just going to assume anyone I don't know from these shows is from NWA Wildside, and I'll probably be right. 
Before the match, the former WCW stars cut a promo that made them come off a bit like false prophets, though at times I think they take it a little too far. What they really need, they need a leader. Somebody that can guide you through the right way of life. Whoa, whoa, hey Disco, what kind of church do you think we're at here? Two matches in and we get two Russo swerves, as Swinger decides to abandon his protege for no reason, allowing Disco and the lamest authority figure in wrestling history to pick up the W. Over on commentary, Scott Hudson is perpetually flummoxed by these turns of events, while Demore is literally playing devil's advocate. A person can only take so much, and then they have to take the road less traveled. I'm starting to see a pattern, Hudson. I'm starting to see that maybe Reverend Jim Mitchell is right. The world seems to be a very, very different place. Starting right here tonight, Mr. Hudson. After all that, Tracy Brooks makes her way to the ring and calls out Mitchell. Sinman offers up desire in a match, which leads to what looks like a soccer mom cat fight. This is the soul of Tracy Brooks and she knew going in. Oh man! It was your turn to bring the juice boxes to practice this week, you bitch! After some distractions on the outside, Desire wins the match via roll-up, meaning that Brooks is now an unwilling servant of Father Mitchell, which never gets brought up again. But hey, at least for now, it's Brooks who's the biggest loser, not Desire. After the match, Mitchell spends some time hyping up Kid Cash. Maybe there is a David in the back to face my own personal Goliath. <laughs> oh, that is an amazing rib. Mitchell issues an open challenge on behalf of Cash, and out comes Sanders and Disco. After a confusing couple of minutes where I'm not sure who the heel's supposed to be, out comes Jimmy Rave to officially answer the call. We get our most athletic contest of the night, but it ends in controversy when Mitchell inadvertently trips the wrong man and costs him the match. Father James berates Cash for losing, gets dumped on his ass by him, leaves, then immediately returns with Alan Funk in drag. And of course Funk is the heel, because what's more sinful than gender bending? Funk is playing the role of Queen Herod, an interesting take on the person responsible for the deaths of John the Baptist and Jesus. The story's straight out of the Bible, folks! Now this show has been plagued, so to speak, with a litany of production issues, most notably the music. Every guy on this show has come out to the same three, maybe four, generic new metal songs. Yeah. Did you see it? It was so quick. Kid Cash gave Mitchell the high side. Here we go. But Wildcat Chris Harris, oh, he gets special treatment. He gets Goldilocks' band to do a live rendition of his TNA entrance theme when he comes out, with lyrics even. If you want to call him that. Yes? Sometimes what? Oh, can I fill in the blanks? You gain 20 pounds and then you tell a knock knock. You go from tag team champ to being a laughing stock. At this point, the NWA World's Champion Jeff Jarrett joins the Scots on commentary and puts himself over. The match ends when he plays Bobby Heenan to Queen Herod's Rick Rude and grabs Harris's ankle during the three count. You gotta believe this is probably the biggest win of Kiwi's career. Jarrett enters the ring as he gets ready for his own match with Elix Skipper. Then we get multiple statements by both Demore and ring announcer Jeremy Borash that Jay Double demands respect. The World Heavyweight Champion Jeff Jarrett has asked me that if you do not show him the proper respect, he is going to leave and never come back. Until he gets the chance to swoop back in with his own congregation and take it over. My favorite part of this match is right in the beginning. They do the classic shtick where the face and the heel each take turns posing on the turnbuckle, the fans cheer and boo accordingly, then the referee goes up at the end to get a pop and he botches it. Jarrett wins the match after Primetime passes out from the pain of the figure four leg lock. Not sure why the ref's doing the hand drop gimmick when his shoulders are on the mat. Double J gets on the microphone and tells all the kids in the church to lie, cheat and steal to get ahead. Then our good friend James Mitchell comes back out and drops the hammer. And when you make a deal with me, it's sealed in blood because I will own your soul. Visibly shaken by those comments, Jarrett's getting ready to skedaddle. I want you to go get my bags because I'm going to the car and I'm getting out of Chattahoochee, Tennessee. When I first watched this, I honestly thought he said bar, not car. But knowing what we do now, that would have made a lot of sense too. 
As he's talking, he's distracted by the sound of someone working a table saw in the other room. He pulls the guy out of the room, and it's our Jesus allegory for the evening, a man named Joshua, played by Andrew Mincy. He warns Jared that his arrogance and vanity is taking him down the wrong path. I am much more, look at me, I am much more than a carpenter. So much more. A carpenter, you say? Well, I've never seen enhancement talent get this much my time before. Joshua enters the ring and confronts Mitchell. Mitchell then brings out what he calls the personification of evil, but it's just Ron Reese in a badly painted cane mask. This match starts off bad but gets worse within minutes, as Joshua jumps off the middle rope and destroys his knee on the landing, which pretty much put an end to Mincy's wrestling career. They rush to the finish where he rolls up evil to win the match, but then Reese gets his heat back. The locker room empties out, but evil still stands tall. And let me tell you, the best part of the show has to be the sight of the Yete in a crappy mask throwing dusty elbows at his opponents. But with a change of heart, out comes Jeff Jarrett, who El Cabong's evil right in the dome with his guitar. So Jesus barely ekes out a win over the personification of evil, and then gets beaten to the point where he's taken out on a stretcher. And the only one who can save the day in all this is Jeff Jarrett? Okay, well considering who booked this thing, was there any doubt? Then to the tune of My Sacrifice by Creed, because of course... Joshua is brought back to the ring, sells for a day and a half, though considering his injury, I'm pretty sure it's not really selling anymore. Then the sinister minister gets one last shot in. I'll always be around, and they can have it all with me. This, I promise you, Joshua. <laughs> so the guy who's supposed to be Jesus is writhing on the ground, covered in blood, and the devil laughs at him and gets away? I think the wrong guy went over here. From that bewildering conclusion, Mincy guts it out through his injury and delivers a heartfelt call to prayer to the audience. And in a moment that Russo himself has said he didn't see coming, even the wrestlers came out to listen to the testimony. And that's how the first ever Ring of Glory show came to an end. Fun little side story from this show. Now, there were a lot of folks backstage who weren't actually involved, but still wanted to see what it was all about. People like Terry Taylor and Dave Sahadi, for example. But perhaps most memorable of all was former WCW jobber Hardbody Harrison. What made his visit so memorable was, as the legend goes, he was flanked by a gaggle of subservient ladies. Two years later, Harrison would be sentenced to life in prison for sex trafficking. Wrestling! But that wasn't the last we'd see of this show. At the end of that same year, the Forum Civic Center in Rome, Georgia would host Ring of Glory The Great Commission. While footage from the church show in Chickamauga is a little harder to find, this show is readily available on DVD thanks to the fine folks at Big Vision Entertainment, which by the way is the same company that produced Wrestling Society X. Quite a range! The production value for this event was way up from the church show. Not only was it in a larger venue that was appropriate for the occasion, there was also better camera work, name graphics, and best of all, that epic voiceover guy that TNA used for years. But a new battle was emerging. A battle that was not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers of darkness. And then there was Ring of Glory. The cast had changed quite a bit from the original show, but the gist of everything remained the same. Now playing the role of the devil was Percy Pringle, aka Paul Bear. While Percy's performance was very different from James Mitchell's, it was still ideal for what they were trying to get across. You were born by me! Maybe not by me, but by your everyday actions! In this version, it was Jazz who betrayed her husband Rodney Mack against Bo Buchanan, formerly known as Bull Buchanan, formerly known as Recon, formerly known as B-Squared. In the tag team match, a seemingly reformed Disco Inferno turned on his partner D'Lo Brown and defeated him with the Village People's Elbow, though I'm not sure if he was able to do that since technically they were still on the same team. Elsewhere on the show, Scott Hudson returned as the play-by-play -play man, though without a color guy like Scott DeMore to bounce off of, he spent a lot of the show just sounding lost. What exactly is Percy Pringle up to? What about those cryptic comments we heard earlier on? What exactly does he have in mind? What does he have in store? Goldilocks is still backstage, though. She sounded somehow even more subdued than before, like she was trying to give Barbara Walters-style interviews. I gotta say, you two, after my first experience here, it was just wonderful, and I know that you'll have the same after. Guys like you, with your experience level and your age, this opportunity doesn't always come around like this. It represents just something that we all strive for as people. Maybe she's bummed that her band didn't get to perform this time. At one point in the show, Percy brings out his personal ring announcer, JB, to replace Bill Barron's, but I'm not sure what that was about since JB didn't do anything heelish. Maybe Percy just had good taste in ring announcers? 
Out comes Spike Dud I mean Matt Heisen, to take on Mark Jindrak. In one of the most obvious metaphors for David vs. Goliath you'll ever see, Heisen scores the upset with a sunset flip, but Marco Corleone gets his revenge. Went down! Hey, calm down, Kevin Dunn. Oh no! No! Oh no! Oh, do you remember that story in the Bible how David slew Goliath, but then Goliath got up and slew him back? Up next, we have an appearance from one of my earliest wrestling memories, Jason Sensation. He brings Ron Simmons to the ring and awards him with a trophy in commemoration for all of his accomplishments in football and wrestling. Thankfully, Iron Mike Sharp and the Iron Sheik weren't waiting backstage. Jason then surprises Simmons with one of his classic impersonations. I'm a two-time All-American from the Florida State. I was the first black WCW champion. Uh, you've done other nation members better. And what the hell am I doing wearing this ridiculous outfit? <laughs> I look like a damn road sign! But the good times are cut short as Disco Inferno crashes the party. Disco starts beating up Jason until D'Lo Brown makes the save. Disco's buddies, Eric Watts and Mike Sanders, come into the ring and gang up on D'Lo, but then Ron Simmons helps clean house, allowing D'Lo to get revenge on Disco for his treachery earlier in the night. Our next match features Kevin Northcutt, who's best known for being one half of the TNA tag team Red Shirt Security. Ugh. Taking on Six Pac. Before the match, Northcutt pulled out a pair of scissors, which implied that someone was getting their hair cut soon, but don't worry, they're never used or brought up ever again. Anyway, Pac wins with the X Factor. I don't have to tell you what he's fought through to get back to this point. Well, they did release One Night in China less than a year before this, so I'd imagine he's trying to do some serious atonement work in this show. In a backstage interview, Vince Russo himself explains what Ring of Glory is all about. I've seen young men, I've seen hundreds of young men with huge hearts, never been given an opportunity for all the wrong reasons, for the politics and the backstabbing and everything that goes with mainstream wrestling. But tonight with Ring of Glory, we're breaking all the rules. That's what Ring of Glory is about. Wait a minute, isn't rule breaking the whole message of the bad guys? Up next is the Stairway to Heaven match between... No stairway. Denied. Between C.J. Summers, Sal Renaro, Jimmy Rave, and Air Paris, who looks to be channeling his inner Hardy Boy. The four men are fighting for the Sword of the Spirit hanging high above the ring. That's some amazing restraint by Russo to avoid putting a jar of holy water or a Virgin Mary candle or an altar boy up there instead. The match began as an elimination match until it came down to the final two, in this case Paris and Rave, then the goal was to climb a ladder to retrieve the sword. The two tried to recreate the finish of the Sean and Razor ladder match at WrestleMania 10, only for them to fail miserably. Oh no! Oh! Paris unsteady on his feet. Four! Rave! That's Jimmy it. Rave! That is it! Dude, at that point, wouldn't it have made more sense for you to just powder out of the ring? But Rave doesn't get to celebrate his victory for long, as Percy and crew give him an ultimatum. Surrender the sword to him in the next 20 minutes or be destroyed. And man does Rave lay it on thick here. 20 minutes ago, I was I was just a kid. I didn't have any responsibilities. I didn't I didn't have to choose one way or another. And now I fought. And, and, and I won this, this responsibility. I didn't know it was gonna be all this. Jimmy, Jimmy, just put down the sword and pick up a plastic guitar. You'll be so glad you did. In what is technically our main event because of the final match of the evening, Jazz comes back out and issues an open challenge to anyone in the audience. And look who happens to be in attendance watching the show but Trinity and Rain, who by that point had just started wrestling and hadn't become Peyton Banks yet. Trinity balks the challenge, but Rain overzealously accepts in her place. Perhaps there's a better time. Okay. Rain spends most of the match getting beaten up until Trinity can stands no more and runs into the ring herself. And now she's also a legal participant in this match for some reason. Trinity hits the moonsault, then brings Rain into the ring to make the cover, and Jazz is defeated in what I guess was a handicap match? Has Vince ever been able to book women properly? That's the equivalent of two fans being goaded into the ring. Scott, it's not the equivalent of, that's exactly what happened. It's finally time for the big decision, as the Percy Posse calls out Jimmy Rave. As Percy demands that Rave hand over the sword and his soul, in walks the lowly janitor Asa, who gets a name key even though he comes in unannounced, and the audience doesn't yet know who he's supposed to be. Like Joshua in the Chickamauga show, Asa, who's played once again by Andrew Mincy, is basically Jesus and confronts Percy, and delivers quite possibly the biggest run-on sentence in a promo I've ever heard. Because to the athlete, he's the victor's crown. To the agnostic, he's the mighty god. To the archaeologist, he's the Ancient of Days. To the attorney, he's the faithful and true witness. To the baker, he is the bread of life. To the biologist, he's the source and center of all life. To the 
the chemistry change the water into the wine to the doctor he is the great physician to the evolutionist the heavens and the earth are the works of his hands to the engineer he's the straight and the narrow way to the farmer he's the lord and the sower of the harvest to the geologist he is the rock of ages to the historian He's the Alpha and the Omega to the investigator. He's a treasure hidden in a field to the judges of this world. He's the judge of all men to the kings of our nation. He's king of kings and lord of lords to the brick mason. He's a sure and a tried foundation to the mechanic. He's the restorer of all things to the photographer. He's the image of the invisible God to the pastor. He is the head of the church to the philosopher. He's the wisdom of the ages to the student. He's the source of all knowledge to the scientist. He's the undeniable evidence to the truck driver. Oh yeah, he's the wheel in the middle of the wheel to the urologist. He rolled the sun away to the veterinarian. He'll make the lion and the lamb lie down together in safety to the weatherman. He's the early and the latter rains and to the zoologist. <laughs> that deserves a retweet. Creation shall give him praise. <laughs> On diet. PP3 has finally had enough of this and orders his goons to attack and handcuff Asa. Jimmy Rave, who is armed with a sword, stands there looking like a schmuck. Finally, Kevin Northcutt has a change of heart and tries to save Asa. Hooray for the skinny fat man we'll never hear from again. Six Pac and Rodney and Matt come in to even the odds, leaving Percy to run away, and once again, the devil doesn't get a real comeuppance. Rave accepts not Jesus into his life, and the show ends with another call to prayer by Asa, who remains handcuffed the entire time, which I find pretty funny. Either two things have happened. If you say that you should change your life for Jesus Christ for the rest of your life, or you're still in the process. Whoa, AJ Styles was there but didn't wrestle? That's the biggest sin of all! So, Ring of Glory, was it truly regretful? Well, depends on your perspective, I guess. If you find any form of Christian pop culture, be they movies, music, or TV shows to be silly or awkward, you might feel the same about this show. If your standards are high when it comes to like exciting in-ring action, you won't find it here. As a wrestling show, it is not great, but as a performance with a message, I think it's okay. I mean, yes, Russo's fingerprints are all over this one, and not always in the best way, but I understand the attempt at combining religion and wrestling. Good versus evil is the simplest story in the world, and who tells that story more often than evangelicals and wrestlers? The concept of God versus the devil is a matchup that is literally of biblical proportions, and that's the basic overarching storyline here, and they managed to do it without insulting the intelligence of the viewers. Still, I think it would have been more interesting if the devil were played by an active wrestler instead of a manager, so you could actually see him take a pinfall in the main event. So although it's not perfect, the message is easy enough to understand. And that seemed to be the most important thing about this, the message. The idea for the whole show is to attract wrestling fans who may not follow Christianity, give them an entertaining show, and give them something to consider at the end of the night. The testimonials by guys like D'Lo Brown, Ron Simmons, and AJ Styles showed that to many of the men, this wasn't just some easy payday. If those guys helped inspire fans with their athleticism, maybe it could help shine a light in other ways. Maybe it got wrestling fans to go to church. Maybe it didn't. Even as someone who isn't the most religious person in the world, I think that what they were doing was a noble enough goal. Russo has even said these are the most gratifying shows he's ever done for that very reason. But while I can understand the idea of taking the power team concept and transferring it over to wrestling, it doesn't quite work the same way. Those jack dudes are actually headbutting boards and tearing apart phone books themselves. Meanwhile, wrestling is a cooperative form of performance art. Obviously, the individual wrestlers can do impressive things and say the exact same message in the end, but with wrestling, you're seeing more of a stage play than actual feats of strength, so to me, it doesn't carry the same weight. As I mentioned earlier, Ring of Glory was meant to be a traveling show that would perform in the church circuit, but the Enterprise shut down after those two shows due to a lack of interest and Russo spending too much of his own money. The pastors apparently didn't want anything to do with pro wrestling due to its seedy reputation, a reputation that, in a bit of irony, was partly cultivated by the very man trying to get this show off the ground. Russo would come back to TNA in 2006 as a member of the creative team and would work there on and off until 2014, when his time as a secret consultant got the company in hot water with Spike TV. To this day, he remains a polarizing figure in the industry. Meanwhile, Dr. Asa Andrews got on to become a successful life and fitness coach, a best-selling author, radio host, and supplement huckster. This despite not being an actual medical doctor. Hard to believe that his past in pro wrestling is somehow less sketchy than his credentials. Like I've said before, when it comes to Vince Russo, you can either love him or hate him, but you can't say he didn't work hard at what he did. And when a megachurch show involving Sting and Shawn Michaels in the same ring is so bad, it makes Ring of Glory look great in comparison? Well, maybe we're not giving you enough credit. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling with Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.